This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Sam Merciers. I'm Dave McDonald. And I'm Nate Blyton. And we're happy to feature Armando by Jolo this week. Armando is a DC-based composer with good relationships with the Great Noise Ensemble. We'll be listening to his trombone concerto a little bit later. But uh, Armando, thanks for being on the show today. Oh, thanks for having me. So what's good going on with you lately? Um, well, I have a good relationship with Great Noise Ensemble. <laughs> <laughs> um, how good are we as, talking? <laughs> seeing as how I started the group, um, <laughs> they still haven't kicked me out after seven seasons. Well, so that's I good. Like, yeah. I guess it's a good sign. But, uh, rumblings are, no, I, things are good. Things are good. Um, I, what have I been up to? I, I, as I was saying before, before the show, um, I am on my first year of what may be many, many years of purely freelance work for the first time in forever. Um, yeah. And I'm kind of curious to see how that's going to go. It's been a, a good um, a good first year, I have to say. I had a, um, a Carnegie Hall debut and a um, – actually, I had two pieces in New York within three days of each other, which was nice. kind of um, kind of exciting. And then about a week later, I found out I won a, a prom grant to write a piece for guitarist and composer DJ Spar. Excellent. Congratulations. Um, something that I, I never thought I would get, and I'm getting it before I'm 40. So that's, uh, that was, yeah. I think I'm having a good year. Um, yeah. I, so. Sounds like it. Yeah. So, and I'm, you know, I've got about four or five pieces to finish before the end of the next summer. So it's good. It's, it's tough. It's a tough way to make a living, but it, it's, yeah. it's a good year. And, you know, Great Noise has a, an exciting season and we're in the midst of. We have a concert next Friday featuring um, Martin Bresnik's, uh, the complete performance of Martin Bresnik's um, uh, Pine Eyes, his version of the Pinocchio story. Um, <laughs> and then the the series that I'm curating for the Atlas Performing Arts Center um, gets off to, to its full season starting in on January 6th. Um, so, so the beginning of 2012, the first half of 2012 is going to be insane in terms of just busyness. So that's great. Um, yeah, yeah, it's all, it's pretty good. That's so, how, how how has your experience as a as a freelance guy compared to uh, what you've been doing recently uh, in academia? Well, I mean, I, I've, I act, my academic work for the last couple of years was as an adjunct, so it was strictly part time, but it was almost full time. So I had enough mm -hmm. classes to yeah. be almost at a full-time schedule, and in, in some schools it would have been a, considered a full-time schedule. All the work um, and half the pay. Exactly, <laughs> and none of the benefits. I hear that. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but you know, actually, I really kind of, I, I have to say, I, I actually enjoyed being an adjunct because at the same time you don't have to worry about too, being on too many committees or, yeah. you know, at Peabody we had to do, you know, we were all expected to be at, um, at, at department meetings and things like that because and this is a great thing about Peabody being a Peabody adjunct was that, you know, in the department didn't see you any differently. You had, you know, you were a colleague and they, you know, didn't, nobody ever looked down on you. In fact, I felt like I was a full part of the department and whatnot. And when, when I left this year, it, you know, I, I, I was, you know, it was, it, it was felt and I, it, you know, I, I, I received lots of, um, of nice emails from students and faculty and colleagues saying, well, why are you doing this? Like, well, it's some, just something I have to do. To, yeah. to give this a try um and we left the door open to come back sure. um cool. so um but it, you know I, that was it was I, I i was still feeling the last three years that you know nothing nothing much has changed other than i'm not commuting to baltimore three times a week and mm -hmm. and that's that's a big change because i was losing two hours yeah. um in traffic every day every other day so yeah. um that's a lot of time when i'm not composing or yeah. doing anything else or watching my kids yeah so so how's how's the freelance life treating you? Well, as I said, it's it's pretty good this year. Um, you know, there are months where you feel like, oh, I've got nothing going on, and um, but this year I've got, let's see, I mean, I, I managed to to get a, a number of commissions that are actually paying, um, which is very nice. Um, I mean, I don't feel I actually feel like I'm busier in many ways because I'm doing. Um, you know, great noise is still chugging along very nicely, and we've just, uh, you know, we're we're sort of cementing our our position. We actually kind of 
people talk about us as being the premier new music group in Washington, and this year I really feel like we're cementing that position. So it's um, that's adding more and more things that I need to be doing. Um, and I have, I mean, I'm not doing that all by myself. I have like great colleagues in the group that are that help with the management, and um, I'm strictly the artistic director, and we have a, a, a managing director and a, a, a personnel manager and an executive director, and we meet regularly, and you know, so. Yeah, that's I a good relationship. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do it by myself, and the players are fantastic, and we get people, you know, we've got a, a huge line of people who want to play with us um, who are not in the core, so we can do some really amazing, exciting things, and, and we're going to be, we, we're in residence at the Catholic University, which, which lets us do um, a lot of great educational work, and we're about to start a, a residency next season at the Atlas uh, Performing Arts Center, where we'll be able to do just amazing, you know, repertoire, and you know, we'll have like a stage crew and lighting, like lighting designers that will. I mean, it's 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 like a full proscenium stage. It's it's. I'm really excited. That's very cool. Uh, and then with curating with the Atlas, we're bringing in some. I'm, I'm getting in touch with some amazing groups that we're bringing in. Um, so I and I've lost my train of thought. I do that a lot. So um, <laughs> that's great. It's great to hear. Um, that it's great. It's, that yeah, that's ahead. going so well. Um, yeah, but this is after like ten years. I finished yeah. my doctorate <laughs> years ago, and I tell you, you know, eight years ago, I didn't think this was coming. I hell, three years ago, I didn't think this was coming. So yeah, um, it's good to hear that about a freelance composer, though. Well, exactly. you know, well it, it is possible. And an independent. <laughs> I mean, I'm not living like Kanye here, mind you. <laughs> that's, that, that's the disappointing part. I'm still expecting, you know, the, the, the hot tub full of money. Right. Yeah. But, we'll, we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get there. It's a work in we'll progress. <laughs> I'm sure there's some grant application that I can <laughs> Right. <laughs> I'm sure music, New Music USA is going to work on that program. That's right. The, the let's, hot start tub. A let's start a white paper. <laughs> How to Let's live like Kanye on a composer salary. Right, Let's email Frank about that. Yeah, Kickstarter so, campaign. I think. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So I wanted to ask you uh, before we get to the stories. Some, some. Dave and I were talking uh, about starting some some more music happenings in the contemporary kind of world and here in Grand Rapids and. Uh, we were discussing how to get people together, uh, getting classical musicians <coughs> together, and. I heard heard some interesting stuff about how uh, great noise ensembles started. Uh -huh. Can you <laughs> tell us about that? Um, yeah, we. Well, before I do, you're in Grand Rapids. You have the Grand, you know, Grand Valley, oh, right? Yeah, that's a, true. We do. Right. I, I, that's where I'm an adjunct at Grand Valley. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, talk to Brian. He knows. Uh, he, we just had him at Atlas, and and there, are, you know, he's doing amazing things with those students. Oh right? yeah. Mm -hmm. When I was at Michigan in. I guess this must have been 1997. I came over to, to see a concert at, at Grand Valley, and and I, I told the students at the, in the New Music Ensemble that when they were here, and they said, oh, that must have been awful. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it wasn't awful, you know, but it was, you know, it was a, a small school kind of a, a, a performance. But, you know, they weren't able to do the stuff that you guys are doing. Um, so you've got a resource there that, you know, I would – I would talk to him definitely. Yeah. It's it's kind of amazing. His students are so into everything they're doing, and he has yeah. like half of uh, every student that I run into in the music program knows about the new music ensemble and wants to mm -hmm. play in the new music ensemble, which is not yeah. something I've experienced at any school I've ever been to. <laughs> so I think there you have a really great resource that I mean, uh, even if you don't ask his players to play for you guys or you know if you're starting starting to start a group um even if you don't get his players you can you know you have a research with an advisor uh with brian that you can you know really you know you can just sit there and say you know hey let's get together for a cup of coffee and you know yeah. how did you do this how do, you know um for me it was just a matter of um in i want to say this is 2004 2003 um well i have to go even way back because i've always wanted to be to start a new music ensemble and i i, I wanted as a student said you know someday I'd like a, a when i land in some academic program if they don't have a new music ensemble i'll start one 
because I th- you know I think it's really important not just to promote my own work but to promote the work of others and to you know help each other out. We're all in this together, I think. Mm-hmm. And the um, you know I I, I had I, I landed all the visiting assistant professorships and all that stuff, but I wasn't landing in a tenure track job. And in 2003, I'd quit a job teaching high school because I, you know, I'm not trained as a high, as a secondary education person, mm-hmm. and was feeling like you know that wasn't you know that was not where I want to go. And if I stick with that, I'm not going <coughs> to do what I want to do. Bless you. And I will, you know, so I left that job, and my wife was also a musician and a friend of ours. We're trying, you know, kind of tried to start a, a, a little orchestra. Um, where the the repertoire would be, you know, kind of mixed, but you know, would have a strong new music component, but not be a new music ensemble, mm-hmm. and tried to go, you know, try to start nonprofit papers filed before we even had a, a performer lined up, um, and we went for for about six months on that, almost a year maybe, and it sort of fell through, for various reasons. Um, our partner actually, you know, got pregnant and realized, well, this isn't really. I can't focus my energy on this anymore, so yeah, I gotta you know be a mom now, and um, and you know about a few months after that, I I said, well, you know, I'm not gonna land anywhere maybe for a while, and you know maybe going the the way of filing paperwork first is not the right way to go. Maybe I'll treat this like a garage band and see, you know, and I I, I went out. I never I don't use Craigslist very much, <laughs> but I used it in this one set in one one instance, and That's I put an ad on Craigslist. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, it's saying look. Um, if you're a musician in D.C. and you like, I, I forget what the composers were. I, I should have saved if if I had known that we were gonna do a group that was gonna last seven seasons and counting, mm. and I would have saved the text of the ad. Right? Like, mm-hmm. I had a, a conductor friend who was trying to, you know, who started his own group in Indianapolis. Yeah. Call me a, a few months ago and say, Hey, do you have the ad for that Craig? The, the text for that Craigslist ad? I think I'm gonna call you. So it's like, Wish I'd saved it. It was seven years ago. I mean, it's the um, internet. I bet it might might still be out, out there, there somewhere. somewhere. Yeah. It's, it's probably out there somewhere. You're right. Um, so I put it out. I think I put like you know, if you like Ligeti, John Adams, Louis Andreessen, the composers that I really like, and you want to perform some of that along with if you're a composer with your own music or whatever. And I put it out an ad, and I got like seven or eight responses. Um, and one of them turned out to be by a, an old friend of mine who's now the percussionist in the group. And he's like, and I, I posted it anonymously. And when, when he showed up to the meeting, he's like, I thought that might have been you, but I wasn't. <laughs> sure. um, and, you know, for at that meeting, then the people that replied and we were in contact by email for a couple of weeks, and they told some friends about it. And we had about 11 people. And then when we sat down with, with a couple uh, in that meeting, then we, we kind of identified a couple of people who were really gung ho about it, who. Um, there's this woman, Heather Figi, in particular, who's, a, who's the, our first, one of our first violinists. She's now moved on to, um, she lives in Eugene, Oregon now, um, and is actually a fantastic kind of jazz and, and world music violinist, as well as a composer and a classical violinist. Um, but she, she sort of said, hey, you know, I'd love to help with organizing and whatever. And so between the two of us and then one other person and um, we we you know sort of got a couple of concerts together. We just knocked on doors and we looked at what we had. It's like, well, we have this eleven person roster. If we find about three more, we'll have one a one to a part chamber orchestra. Mm-hmm. And we went around looking around and you know and, and people who were already in there started calling their friends and it, it just sort of became this grassroots thing. Um, and it still continues as a grassroots thing. I mean, we still. Um, None of us get paid unless we get hired by somebody else's series, um, and yet somehow people still want to play for us. And uh, the other thing is that in rehearsal we don't have any of the, like you know we don't we, we get along. We don't have really ugly rehearsals yeah. a lot of the time. We don't have the, the typical. I'm not a typical conductor who who will sit there and you know want to have my ego stroked or anything like that. I kind of see myself as just another member of the group, and mm-hmm. um, I'm open to their critique and to their suggestions they treat it like unless we're doing really big pieces like when we did them last year um where you know you have to run a rehearsal differently in that right. case but um when it's the uh, the core group you know i run it like chamber music and yeah. so i think there's there's that and you know when when i talk to to my colleagues and friends in the group like yeah it's just it's a nice atmosphere and we get to play music that we don't get to play anywhere else and so you know 
we, it's nice when we get paid and, you know, we're working towards getting the funding in place so that we can get, my dream is to make this everybody's, um, everybody's full-time job um, with benefits and a salary, <coughs> um, a, strong, a good salary and, and all that stuff, but that's a very long-term goal that we're slowly making headway towards. So, um, and everybody's so far been incredibly good and incredibly patient about it and we just have a good time and there's nobody else in dc really that was doing the kind of large ensemble stuff that we were doing so it, it's sort of a bit of serendipity in there as well yeah. and that's a big part of it that sounds like that's a really valuable approach though getting the interest and getting the people together first and then setting yeah. up the administration around that yeah, and it, you know, you find people in that way. You find people who are really passionate about the group, um, who stick around, um, and and who, and actually, and you know, it's funny. It made me think. Dave um, Cutler on the Savvy Musician put up. Um, he was working with musicians at the uh, at the New World uh, Symphony. Symphony, and that it, it struck me as like, oh, he's doing some of the things that we're doing, where you know, the administration comes from within the group and with. You know, you when you hire musicians, you hire musicians not just because they can play well, but they also, with the expectation that, oh, you're also outreach, you're also ambassadors for the group, you're also expected, mm -hmm. you know, I, let's identify what talents you have, right. whether it's administrative or outreach or educational, and, and use those as well. And I think that's the way ensembles are going to have to go, in, or are going, really, it's, it's I think. Um, in in the twenty first century, yeah, cool. Can you, can you tell us about this series that you're you mentioned this earlier? The series that you're curating? Yeah, Atlas Arts, um, the Atlas Performing Arts Center. We're we're Oops. Atlas Performing Arts Center has been around in DC for for a good number of years, but has been primarily um, they haven't been a presenter until this year. Um, and executive director, the new executive director there, Sam Sweet, decided he wants to to start presenting and develop Atlas as DC's answer to symphony space. Um, so he's mm -hmm. developed this really great lineup of, um, of unusual or, I don't want to say unusual, but not necessarily, um, I want to say cutting edge, but that's also become a cliche. But <laughs> um, what he did was instead of hiring a programming director, he split that position up into a curatorial board. And so we have a curator for jazz, a curator for world music, a curator for theater and dance, and a curator for new music, myself. Hmm. Um, and so we do, I think the goal is to do six to nine or six to 12 concerts a year. Mm -hmm. um, this season, we're doing, I think, seven. We started with the Grand Valley State University um, New Music Ensemble in November. Cool. Um, which was a, a sort of a preview event. We treated it as a preview event because, um, you know, GVSU was doing a, a, a East Coast tour and they contacted us through DJ Spar um, and said, hey, you know, we're looking for one more venue. We don't, it won't cost anything. And this is a month before the date. So we said, well, yeah, of course, that's great. And if it doesn't cost anything, if you don't mind, we'll make it a free show to kind of introduce people to what we're doing. Um, so, and then in January then, so that was our, our kickoff event. Um, and in January, we have a, re a recital with DJ Spar and, and friends doing some of his own music and other electric guitar um, pieces. And then followed very closely by Ethel, cool. the string quartet, cool. yeah. who's going to come and do different trains and a big piece by John King from, from I forget where he's teaching, actually, NYU, I want to say, um, or maybe Columbia, but um, it's a New York-based composer, John King, who's a, maybe not a household name, but should be. Um, fantastic composer, and then we're following that up with. I, and I may be completely out of order in terms of well, like what we're having because I'm going off the top of my head. But we have Imani Wins coming along, cool. um, followed by the Janus Trio, the flute, harp, um, viola trio uh, from the new Amsterdam roster out of Eastman. Nice. Um, they're fantastic. I'm I'm just in love with their sound. Kathy Supove is going to do a recital, which I'm really excited about. Um, then let's see, we have, gosh, why am I blanking out? Um, oh, ICE, ICE is going to come and do oh, it cool. part of a, of a, in April, what they're going to do, or no, early May, when they're doing a, a sort of residency, um, 
with between three presenters, um, and we're one of them. Um, so we're, we've, we're doing the large ensemble concert for ICE um, in May. Um, in June, we have the, um, we're finishing up the season with a new, what I call a new new music super group. Um, it's <laughs> the, Deviant, the Deviant Septet, um, which is on their first season but it's a group based um, based in New York made up is the same or instrumentation as the Soldier's Tale. Okay. Um, and they're commissioning a bunch of different composers and touring. And it's all made up of uh, people from Signal and Alarm Will Sound and other major new music groups based in New York. Um, mm. It's really exciting. I'm trying to think if I've left anybody out. Well, there's Great Noise Ensemble is doing a concert in the series, but yeah, that's sort of a given as well. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> some little group in Washington. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hey, you, know, we're trying, you have a pretty good trying, relationship with them, I think. Right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I I know them. Like I, I, a couple of people I email with uh, every now and then. You know, a couple of months, but uh, um, you know, they've played a couple. I'm of just pieces looking of, at all the pieces that you had performed there, and I was like, oh, that's a good relationship. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I try I actually try not to program too much of my stuff. So with great noise, because it's. Uh, I don't want it to seem like it's the Armando Bajolo band. That's mm. that's just a side project, I think. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> someday I'm gonna have a, a, a side project. The Armando Bajolo. Uh, but it's you know, oh. the. Uh oh, I think we might have lost Armando. Seem, um, I don't want it to. Seem yeah, so you're hearing that too, Dave? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Armando. We're, Armando, we're, I think we're, we're losing you. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, Sam. I can hear you just fine. We, we just lost your audio and I for a little while and your, your video okay. froze, but it seems like you're back now. Um, yeah, I saw, I saw the video freeze there too. Yeah. That's all right. We'll, we, we can, we can, we can, uh, we can keep going. <laughs> No don't have a, I like the, the technical <laughs> We do have a, sh a thing that we <laughs> put up. Yeah. Uh oh. Exactly. It's a cat that goes, help. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> we're having technical difficulties. Oh, we're back now. <laughs> what was that we're picture? Back. It was a cat in need of help. Oh, is that that's your help. technical difficulties yeah. picture? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, we're back now, though. Back Everything's now. everything. Okay. Um, so it sounds like you've got some really great stuff going on in D.C. It, this is probably mm -hmm. stuff that you wouldn't have had time for um, while trying to do everything at Peabody and commuting. Uh, I was doing all this while <laughs> doing everything at Peabody. That's crazy. Um, it's nuts. But I also have two children. Mm. Yeah. That's so, really crazy. That's really crazy, and the the thing is that now I'm home, so they can actually take things like music lessons, um, uh. which they're fine. In fact, tonight I have a, a major major performance. My nine year old is giving her recital debut. Um, oh, nice! In Alexandria, so on guitar and piano. Oh man, nice! So really exciting, yeah. And uh, it's a little bit scary that she's actually good at this. So <laughs> she's, she's qualified to be in David Cutler's new orchestra. There you go. <laughs> and by by twenty twenty, she'll be all there. That's right. And what's going to happen is that actually, you know, I'm both excited, excited and worried because it's like, well, God, it's really hard to make a living as a musician. But at the same time, what wouldn't it be cool in like ten years? If she's really, if she gets with it and she's really good, I could write her pieces. Yeah, yeah. And that would be just amazing. I, I look at George Crum writing pieces for his daughter that she performs everywhere. I think that's so cool. You know, that I would love to have that. But yeah. I also, she's my kid, and I know, you know, I'm. It's <laughs> not easy. Right. It's like I don't want you to go through this, honey. It's like wow, but <laughs> it's, it's very conflicting. But you know, it's crazy. It is crazy. But um, you know, it's. I think if I wasn't doing something crazy, I wasn't like splitting myself up a billion ways, I would feel like I'm not doing anything, you know? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right. And when, when, when things slow down, there are times when it's just like, wow, I feel like I've got nothing going on. And that's like when, when depression hits or something, it's like, right. I've got nothing going on. But then I think, i got to finish copying these parts so this piece will get done next year. It's like, oh, wait, I should really enjoy to just take this time and relax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, I feel like that's the composer's life, like taking yeah. the plunge and doing everything all at once and then taking a month off. 
And <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's also, you know, there's also, you know, it, it's it's crests and troughs, you know, so there'll be really good years and then there'll be kind of slower years. And, yeah. Um, so, and, and that's something you have to get used to. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, so the most important question is when is or, or has Great Noise been involved in or are they going to soon become involved in commissioning pieces? Oh, we commission all the time. Um, mm -hmm. We just don't have the money to commission. <laughs> so uh, when we commission, it's basically – but we have um, a really – what's turned out to be a really nice royalty structure with BMI and ASCAP. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how they, they do it. That's not our doing, but um, – when we commission, we um, that's sort of the understanding that it's like, well, we don't have money to pay you, but we'll perform it, and it'll be a nice venue, and it'll, it'll probably get reviewed. We get good press. Um, right. Okay, I'm not sure if all the press we get is good, but we do get good press mm -hmm. coverage, um, and we do get. We're, we're we've been lucky with the press we've gotten, but it's not cool. not all. But anyway, so, that's, any, so any that's press another is good show. Press. Any yeah. press, is good press. press exactly. Well, you know, I don't know. All right, that's it. let's edit this in post. <laughs> um, that's a whole nother show, like critics and all that stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. completely cut out. Nobody will see that. <laughs> okay, good. Um, no, but it, so when we commission people, it's sort of on that understanding. But you know, I'm hoping that it will it will change very you know soon. Um, but. Um, no, but we've commissioned. Why do you ask? Like, when when does it seem like we haven't commissioned? A little. No, I just wanted. I was I was baiting you to talk about commissioning, basically. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, what do you want to know about commissioning? I mean, we well, just think... really, we, yeah. we we don't have any money for it. So it's basically, <laughs> we need repertoire. Yeah. And you uh, need a gig. So, so yeah, we can make this work. You know. Help each other out. I mean, you'll get royalties for it, right? And um, and yeah. yeah. So it's been no, but we've premiered. In fact, we've got um, two big premieres coming up in January. We, we've got a piece that Cornelius Dufalo is um, has written for us for himself to play with us on electric violin. Um, cool. He's written a piece for it's electric violin with you know with his loopers and, and stuff that he does, um, cool. which is amazing. He's just an amazing player. And he will join a, it's a Piero ensemble contingent from Great Noise. And we're taking that to New... We're playing it in January in D.C. and then taking it to New York in April for the Cutting Edge Festival um, oh. at Symphony Space. And then we're premiering a piece in that same concert in, on January 20th by Sean Doyle, who's a former student at Peabody's. Or actually, you know what? I think he's still a student at Peabody's. He's dissertating. Um... So, but he's he's living in Fredonia, New York, right now. He's a, a adjunct at SUNY Fredonia, where he did his um, either undergraduate work or his master's or both, actually, um, which he's written for us um, and for the soprano Lisa Perry, who's a, a Peabody uh, graduate student. Oh, we know Lisa. Soprano. You know Lisa. Oh, yeah. oh, we went to school with yeah. Lisa. Uh, <laughs> Lisa yeah. was Lisa was a, a singer and a composer yeah. at MSU. Yeah, she she and I were composition yeah. undergrads together. That's cool. <laughs> well, small world. Lisa's yeah. involved with her now, and she's sung with uh, she's sung with us a few times. She she's fantastic. Her. Yeah. Oh, that's Lisa. Yes. Who? Lisa that, Perry. Oh. Yeah. oh. Okay, I wasn't <laughs> connecting it there. Yeah. Okay. So, well, she's gonna she's gonna freak when she sees this. <laughs> um, so yeah, cool. she's she's sung with us mostly in ensemble stuff. She sang in the, in the chorus of Demeteri, and she just did with a number of other uh, singers from Peabody um, music for eighteen musicians with us in September. Oh, cool, cool. And she's gonna sing this uh, this uh, orchestral chamber orchestral song cycle that Sean Doyle has written for her and Great Noise called Letters from Zelda. It's all. Um, setting <laughs> text from uh, Zelda Fitzgerald to um, to um, F. F. Scott Fitzgerald. I want to say Ella Fitzgerald. What's wrong with me? <laughs> F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, cool. Yeah. So that, I mean, those are the big two commissions we've got going for for next year. I'm working on a big commissioning project where I'm asking a number of composers, and this is a project I've, I've had cooking for a couple of years, and I've decided. 
uh, it's we're trying to work it for next season, but it may very well be having at this point needing to be pushed back another year. But mm-hmm. um, I'm a huge Beatles fan hmm. um, to the point that it, I've taught classes, like theory classes on the Beatles at this yeah. point. So it's become a career aspect for me, this fandom. And I've had this idea for a couple of years of commissioning composers to do um, not remixes, but like p- pieces based on aspects of songs from the Sgt. Pepper album and doing a, a whole evening show out of that. So we're in the process of commissioning a number of composers. Uh, let's see, there's Jeffrey Gordon, Mark Mellitz, um, uh Kevin McKee, who's a, a member of Great Noise. Uh, Mark Sylvester is another member of Great Noise. And Blair Goins, uh, the third member of Great Noise, who's also a composer. Um, let's see, have I, I mentioned Mark. Um, Christy Custer, we've talked to. Ryan Brown, John Russell, um, uh, Danny Felsenfeld. And I haven't decided whether I'm going to do something or not yet, but um, probably. Um and so they each take one or two songs, and we'll build a show around it, and hopefully, you know, do it do it, a big production at Symphony Space, and then hopefully tour it. Um, but it's you know it's a complicated project to do, and I'm I'm hoping to find some funding for it. They're all they've all been really grace, um, excuse me, gracious, and taking the commission just on the the typical understanding that we don't have any money, so we might not be able to pay you, but we'll we'll play it at least the one time, and then we'll do. What the hope is to tour it and develop it in that way, and you know, so you'll get performances out of it, you'll get good royalties. So, um, but I'm I'd like to step back and find actual funding for it to pay people at least a, a small amount for their work. Um, so that's sort of been in the back and front burner, off and on for a couple of years, and I'm I'm trying to work it for next year. Um, I would see that show absolutely, no doubt. Yeah. yeah um, well, I was wondering, uh, uh, as just a sort of a side note, do you have the uh, Beatles complete scores? You can get it in a hardbound book that's I, all of their output with full orchestration. I do, and I didn't even pay for it. Ah, neither did I. I got it for Christmas. I assigned it for a class. Hey. Uh, yeah, so, so. There you go. It's a game the system. No, it's uh, it's it's one of the perks of being a professor is that you get desk copies, and so it's uh, probably probably should return it. Um, but uh, no, I I get it. It's, it's a fantastic book. It's it's a great resource. Um, it's a serious document. Yeah. Yeah, and you get it. Um, the I I I assigned it because I used uh, Walter Everett's book on the Beatles, and he he's his citations are all based on that score. Okay. So, um, so it's very useful to have the scores while you're reading the book. Yeah, he's very much into the Beatles. I read an analysis of Abbey Road that he did. Yeah, well, that's that's an article. That's like that was his first major or one of his first major Beatles art- articles, and he reworked it for the Abbey Road chapter in um, in in the Beatles as musicians. It's a fantastic book. It's an amazing book. Um, and he's got oh my gosh, I mean, he transcribes in that book. He transcribes um, like. Sketches. I mean, he gets. He got a hold of like a bunch of old tapes and old demos. He actually, when I was at Michigan, I remember sitting, being in his office at one point and seeing a picture of him. He's like, a picture. He got a picture of himself with Yoko. I'm like, that's Yoko. And I was like, yeah. I was just researching some John Lennon stuff, and she gave me a bunch of tapes. I'm like, whoa. Can I hang out with you? I'm like, so, um, no. He's Walt. Walt's fantastic. Yeah. Revolver Through the Anthology is the name for people out there interested. All right. Well, it's, that's volume two. Okay, that's volume and, two. Uh, the whole book is called The Beatles as Musicians, and volume one is The Quarrymen Through Rubber Soul. Okay. And then volume two is Revolver Through the Anthology, and that one actually came out first. Um, that, I remember when that one came out because I was a grad student at Michigan when it came out, and we were all really excited. Oh, Walter's come out finally with his book on the Beatles. Um, and then volume one came out a couple of years later. Um, so it's a two-volume set. All right. Well, I don't think you find any of those albums on the 100 best albums of 2011. <laughs> no, no. They're a little, a little old. Yeah. 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 Armando's too engaging. We, we can't move on to the, the story. <laughs> All right, I'll stop. I'll just... <laughs> Go. Dave, a, an interesting thing that I wanted to point out about, um, and the reason I say Dave is because you control the audio. 
Um, this is an interesting list, and I agree with a lot of the choices. The uh, Fleet Foxes album is awesome, Helplessness Blues. But number 14, uh, Outer Burrow by Todd Reynolds. Sam, we need to mention what we're, we're talking about, Ted Joya's list of the 100 best albums of 2011. Mm -hmm. Right. Sorry. Uh, I was to do that part. Yeah. <laughs> Ted Ted Joya, who's a really fantastic uh, writer, kind of a critic, musicologist. I I know him best for his uh, volume on the history of jazz, um, but he's he's writ written a lot of really really good stuff, um, and he's currently compiling uh, his list of. Or I guess he's probably already compiled it. He's currently publishing his list of the hundred best CDs of twenty eleven counting down he's up to 11 now so there are 10 left um and they are across he says all genres uh though nate takes uh <laughs> some umbrage I mean, with that there's no no metal no electronic no like noise or anything <laughs> there's a yeah. lot of good stuff right and in his contemporary classical stuff there's a lot of good stuff some stuff even that we've had as as picks of the week um and so just some of the um some of the genres that are here i'm looking at bluegrass singer songwriter classical jazz yeah. blues ambient r&b country latin jazz this norwegian singer songwriter right. is, is listed here for at least Wait, one how many is that is that bjork that's it no she's icelandic sorry yeah <laughs> um, sorry that just seems like a really narrow category well i I'll, well, I'll, I'll stay quiet in the background now. No, that's no, it's, cool. It, like, <laughs> there's, Nate, a, there's a lot of good stuff. You're well, concerned about Electronica? Here's, I want to know where the concerned? categories... Well, Nate said that there was no electronic music. Oh. I want to know where the the genres come from. Who subscribed them? Did he do it? or is I'm that guessing like, he did. Well, <laughs> Todd yeah, Reynolds, mean, like, number what? 14, Outer Burrow. You can go to Amazon and preview that. And the first track... I mean, play, you can sample the first track and listen to Trans America. I mean, that it's, was I, I was making a generalization that all. <laughs> well, no, no, no. What I'm saying is they call this contemporary classical. Yeah. But it sounds like house music, and I don't know, I don't know where that comes from. Like, wh why subscribe that uh, genre to it to begin with? If it, you know, I don't think it sounds anything like contemporary classical music at all. It's. I mean, it's, it's make, making Mason those distinctions. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> What's that? There it is. This is it. All right, that's not house music. Well, you're right. But it's beat-oriented electronica. Yeah. Well, the, like I don't if I know. heard that at a, it's if I heard that at a club with a bunch of people, you know, spinning glow sticks around and stuff, it would seem perfectly <laughs> in place. <laughs> it's not enough kick drum, but anyway, yeah, that's problem. a different discussion, I think. <laughs> no, I think the, the discussion there, I think, is uh, one of genre. Yeah, really, exactly. What does, right. what does genre mean anymore? And it's, yeah. Like, why bother is what I'm getting at, putting yeah. something like that. If you think it's a great album, say this is one of the greatest albums of the year, but I think it's just misleading to put that label on it. Right, and trying to make those distinctions. It's well, it's always a fusion of these things or a collaboration across genres of, of all this stuff when it's really just people making music. You know, I mean, I think for, for Joya, that's probably just a way for him to help people find the stuff that they might be the most interested yeah. in. I don't know if... I mean, clearly, he's grouping them all together in his in his list. But Right. I mean... I don't know if is is he considering this a ranking? I guess that's not really that important, or if he's just collecting the hundred. I don't know. know. Well, well, it, it is a sweet leaf. He's counting down, so it's yeah, a good list, best. though. Yeah. The, the stuff like, on here so that I know is all good stuff, and the stuff Absolutely. on here that I don't know, I'm pretty interested in checking out. Yeah, this Becca Stevens album is great. Number. So I was telling you guys earlier, since yeah. NPR had the Brooklyn Rider. Still Glass CD as their number one pick of 2011 of the, so Of far. the first, like, half of, of first, 2011. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of the first three. <laughs> That's right. Um, I wonder if it'll make the top ten hit list. I don't know. Time maybe, will tell. Maybe they maybe they have different opinions about music. That's, I know, <laughs> kind of silly, but... You don't it's see that show. Yeah. <laughs> People with different opinions? We don't like opinions on Sound Notion. Go to line. Cut. All right. All right. 
<laughs> so I think we've kind of destroyed that one. Um, <laughs> next on our list, uh, the this the Sonic Shanty is that what we're calling this? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a. The the idea of whether or not you want a physical representation of your music like a CD, <laughs> this is like, uh, do you want the recording or do you want the shanty house? <laughs> <laughs> you could now, have a recording New or you could have this building. Yeah. yeah. Well, in New Orleans right now, there is a, a an installation piece, I guess you would call it, that uh, – ah, uh, crap. What are they calling this? The music box. The music box, box. The music box which uh, – it's it's a this is actually this shanty town that's in place has different rooms and in every room there's an instrument some instruments make different kinds of noises and uh, use parts of the building themselves and some have instruments installed in them but this is actually a practice session by an artist uh, from New York she goes by the name Swoon and will be creating a bigger more permanent installation called Divi Divi Rambalina. I don't know what that means. We should see if Google knows what it means. <laughs> uh, uh, well, if you type that in, it pulls up information about her and her installation. So oh. she owns that term on on uh, Google. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, it premiered uh, with about 200 people watching, and musicians entered the structure and performed a concert that lasted about 30 minutes. So everybody's in their own little room using the in installed noisemakers to produce uh, a piece that lasted about 30 minutes and then the audience members were invited to explore the space and look around and see everything so it to me um it's a cool project and i knew that nate would and dave would like it because we all like to build stuff and tinker with things yeah <laughs> and she's talking about the collaborators she wants to use and she said calls them tinkerers cool excellent so anyway if you're in new orleans you should check it out um, I would love to be able to see it. And then the uh, the other bigger piece is going to be in New Orleans as well, and it's going to be more permanent. They say it's going to be on the same place in the same lot as this right. current setup. So this is a, a series of a couple of structures that are on the same lot, I think. Right. Which is pretty cool. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, it's the kind of thing that, that would be harder to do in, in a lot of places it's, certainly you couldn't do this in manhattan you know there there's not enough space for a thing like this there's um, plenty of shanty towns and or shanty areas in new orleans sure mm -hmm. so can you manipulate these instruments uh if at that music box or are you just do they give you a instrument in a in a room that's part no of the like the, the, they're part of the room right so, okay like, so yeah, the, they're the, installed there's I think it mentions a pipe organ that's on controlled by the steps, um, and there are all kinds of things controlled by like the floorboards and things built in. There might be some that are like just handed to you, like like objects that they hand to you. But I think the the main idea is that the the structures themselves are the instruments, which is kind of a cool thing that you uh, walk inside of the musical instrument, right? Yeah. You know. Any fans of the show out there who would like to shoot some video and send it to us or put it on YouTube and send us a link, that would be awesome. Yeah, that yeah. would be super. We would we would totally show that. Yeah. Right. Um, that's that's really cool. Um, next, a cu couple of awards coming up, uh, or, or some coming up, some just rewarded. Esapekka Salonen won the 2012 Grawmeyer um which is very cool. Congratulations mm. to Esapeka. Um, what was the piece? I had it written down. And it's a violin concerto. Oh, okay. Yeah. And interestingly, you can look. They go all the way back to 1985. Two years, they didn't award an award. I think it was like 88 and 96 or something. Mm. I don't remember. But a lot of violin concerti and concerti in general, in general have won. Um, so like 2004, Concerto for Violin and Orchestra by Unsuk Chin. 2005, Zor uh, George uh, Zotakis? Zontakis? Violin Concerto number two. And I forgot I think George had a Grawmeyer. Huh. I Pierre Boulez won in, in uh, 2001, uh, but there's lots. Cool. They, they seem to like Concerti in this contest. Yeah. Hmm. 
keep that in mind for everyone <laughs> trying to win a Grommeyer. Concertos right. are the way to go. Yeah. And then there's the controversy with uh, there was a, con- a small controversy on on Facebook about Esopeka winning the Grommeyer because apparently in the original mission statement, um, the Grommeyer was supposed to go to a to an emerging or struggling mid career composer, huh. but um, apparently that's never happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, Boulez in you know nineteen or two thousand one. See. Yeah, he's he's doing. Yeah, Boulez finally gets his big break in two thousand one. Right. Well, the first one was given to Ludoslavsky, apparently. Yeah. Right? Um, Eighty like Symphony Number no. Three. Eighty five, the Third Symphony. You know, standard rep stuff now. And uh, yeah. um, okay, it's maybe I don't know if it is, but it's 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 as close to standard. It's rep as close as we got. Yeah. The first and, three Awards went to Ludoslavsky, Ligeti, and Burt Whistle, which yeah, those guys were really in the eighties were not doing well. I mean, who it's were they? Fun. Really? Um, <laughs> if only there was some either. kind of textbook I could find <laughs> right. that would have them thoroughly documented. Right, but, the, the, but here's the thing. I mean, so so and people were like, I know a couple of people on Facebook were complaining about whether that was uh, fair or not, but mm-hmm. you got to ask. Okay, so the mission statement says one thing, but the practice says another. So which one do you go with? And you know, yeah. I don't think anybody expects the Guamayer to be an award for emerging composers anymore. No, or e- ever really did. Um, I so. think there's a reciprocal relationship between the, res- the the granting organization and the person who receives it. You know, I'm yeah. su- sure that Solonen likes getting the award, and they like having Esapeka Solonen at the top of their you know right. list of dudes. Sure. Right. So it's it's a I'd never heard of this award before, but it's uh, important to point out that they have actually five categories. It's a really sort of high minded, uh, supposedly high minded award. They have education, mm. ideas improving uh, world order, music composition, mm. psychology, and religion, which is sort of a an, well, they're an in Kentucky. Of categories, <laughs> yeah. Huh. So anyway, congratulations, congratulations to. Uh, Maestro Solonen. <laughs> Indeed. Scare tactics. Boo. Yep. Ah. <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> I was a little startled. Uh, I don't have hiccups anymore. That's <laughs> this week, a uh, friend of the show, uh, David Smook, wrote an article for New Music Box <laughs> called Scare Tactics. And uh, he's talking or kind of lamenting the uh, lack of of controversy associated with both uh, popular music of the day, you know, current popular music, uh, comparing it to the way uh, Elvis, you know, and his hips caused a stir on Ed Sullivan and Jim Morrison saying, girl, we can't get much higher and all these kinds of things. Um, And then also postulates that that kind of controversy could be a helpful uh, thing in uh, contemporary music, experimental music, actually. And we know that David is a, uh, a big experimental composer, a self-professed, self-described experimental composer. Um, so um, there's a lot to unpack in here, and I don't want to start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'll I'll do it because I I gotta give David grief because he's a friend. And <laughs> he's actually going back to commissioning. He's uh, writing a concerto for himself and Great Noise. Uh, we're premiering in May. So I um, saw that actually. Yeah. Um. So um. And I actually, I think I commented on this in his thread um, mm-hmm. that I think the idea is, it's a nice one, but I think it's it's and I think he has some very good points as he often does. Um, but I wonder if it's even possible because of the fragmentation of of media, quite frankly. And you know, and I think a couple of comments is, and if I remember correctly, David himself may have said this in the article that you know it's a matter of like look with. It, when Elvis was shaking his hips on Sullivan, there were three channels. Yes. You know, three networks. Um, so, I mean, even with with gangster rap and with um, when stuff, you know, when NWA was coming along and, and people like that, they were still, you know, three, four networks where cable TV was not, was, you know, big but not huge and not like the hundreds of channels that we have now and right. you know the internet didn't exist um and now we have a, a marketplace where if you don't like something 
you know, be aware of it because you can right. just be very narrow, put the, the internet blinders on and and just be aware of, I mean, heck, I was going through Ted Joyer's list and thinking, I, have, I don't even have time to listen to 100 albums in a year. <laughs> right. um, he must not have kids. But um, <laughs> well, I don't know. But it's it's a um, an interesting question. Um, fear and inducing fear in an in an audience. Um, yeah. Or or success the scandal as they were called with the Rite of Spring. Right. The the riot. It's like oh, it's scandalous. We must hear this piece that causes a riot. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Press. And and I think the other side of that is that it's hard to go experience uh, something that's new without knowing what you're getting into right like mm-hmm. everybody is is you know trying to prepare you for their concert experience saying oh this is what you're going to hear at this concert um I, I think there's a lot less chance that anybody's going to be surprised by what they're about to hear right and and also i think is, at least in in concert music i think we've gotten about as crazy as crazy can get and if anything we're retreating uh, oh, yeah. a little bit in finding new unexplored ground in in kind of the <coughs> the the more comfortable part. Right. To me that fear is all about like building up an expectation like and if you're like you might get a ride if you're like a whole culture of people going to an opera and expecting to see one thing and having this crazy thing happen instead. And with with so much new music like the expectations like anything's fair game. Right. And so like there's not going to be the same level of surprise possible. I think. Well, you know what I find interesting is that this made me think, uh, and I forget who wrote it now, or I think it was, was it? No, it wasn't the Jan Swafford article from a few months ago from Slate, but uh, there was an article about how earlier in the year about how composers they were particularly focusing on on Judd Greenstein and and Missy Mazzoli and the new Amsterdam um, composers. Uh, Justin Davidson for New York Magazine. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So where like th- he was lamenting that they weren't fighting against anything, that it was the you know that that w- I thought that was interesting that 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 con- that was causing controversy that that, that lack composers of con- are the saying lack of controversy. yeah the lack of controversy is causing controversy right it's like well composers used to say to their previous generation no more I'm gonna rebel against you and now composers are saying hey you know that's nice let's see what we can do with yeah, this that and, was pretty cool and like and, <laughs> But I actually, you know, that's like the Ivesian, the very American way of like where Ives would say, look, just because something is new or is old doesn't mean it doesn't have to be usable, you know? So he would, and he would mix t- old hymns with crazy atonal and microtonal things. And, mm-hmm. and that was fair game and that was all right. And I think uh, that's very much something that's going on now. That's where it's synthesis and, and it doesn't cause friction. And the fact but the irony is that the fact that it doesn't cause friction causes friction. Right. Yes. Um, yeah, I, f- it, I feel like it's a new challenge now to, to build a piece that has a context that's strong enough on its own merit that you that you can build that suspense, you can build that surprise w- and it's right. you know, locally. And that, uh, yeah, it's... But it, also, it, I think, yeah, I think the fun thing, too, I mean, when you think about Rider Spring, mm-hmm. going way back to that example, is that... Um, that was a huge ballet performed by a huge ballet company. And nowadays, you know, those companies that we, we have such, and I'm not sure that the resources are financial resources are any less or more limited than they were a hundred years ago. Um, but I can't back that up with paperwork either. So, um, but I, you know, the, the impression is, and it comes up, especially with ballet and opera. Yeah. Where, where it's so expensive to produce something mm-hmm. that you don't want to <coughs> produce something that's going to alienate your entire audience. It's right. like you're going to get a success. Like it was so awful that we rioted in the street. <laughs> um, and yeah, that would get good press, but you don't make your investment back. Right. Um, and so there, I think there's a fear in producers in, in producing work that might backlash in any way. Right. Um, but also, you know, there's the fragmentation of media where, you know, you can you got to get your word out, and your word. You know, it's hard to get an, a big audience in there, and the the audiences that riot are big audiences. Let's yeah, face but it. But even if you did have a, if you were producing something like an opera for the Met or something, and let's mm-hmm. say it had that that kind of cachet as like today's Rite of Spring or something like that, I still I don't think there'd be any riots. I think the days of rioting over art like that is are pretty much over, at least in this country. 
Not that. Well, yeah, you've been right. reading Twitter in the last few I, hours. I don't know. I don't know about in France if that would still happen, but what's happening in France? Well, like well, it's been happening it's, the last few hours. Right, when the right well, last happened. last night there was there were there were Occupy protests at uh, the Met in oh, in the right. hall. They were not oh, protesting the music. They right, were not protesting that's, Gnode. That's like completely different though. Yeah. I don't so, know. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it's a different question. I didn't want to bring it up until we get to number eight here. I, <laughs> the, you know, the, the whole thing with Glass protesting his own opera or, or speaking <laughs> of <laughs> that, opera. That was a little weird. <laughs> and, it, yeah, that brings up uh, – that's a whole other question. And we'll get know, there. It, yeah. So, it's, it, to me, the, the sa- this really salient paragraph is the last one. It says that uh, over the past um, – <clears throat> recently – uh, composers have been trying to create a new mode of expression that welcomes people into it, that reaches out towards the engaged mm-hmm. listener. And I think that's true. Like a good example yeah. would be Nico Muley. You know, his lots of people would find his music appealing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's a challenge to make it like not upset the jaded composers that have podcasts. You know, and say, <laughs> and, and say that they sold they sell out, but also something that you know, quote, average listeners can enjoy and that is a hard thing um and but then he says uh, having this lack of shock and fear in pop music might be an opening for new music uh possibly but you know as a composer i don't think you can think that way probably as someone who runs a new music ensemble that might be a useful way to think in that do some pieces that do reach out and try to is connect that a hint with, there sam <laughs> uh well you know if that's you're doing nice. a concert that's uh you know an hour long put one scary super weird a uh, piece in there, I think, would be a good thing to do. Well, and... I, I, I'm biting a head off a bat in our next concert. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see what that does. Um, no, I'm with. I mean, actually, but it, I, I tend to be more on the um, on the Nico Muli side of the of the fence, um, but not in the trying to write music or trying to present concerts that are appealing to as wide an audience as possible. But rather, I'd like to put in a season maybe or in a, certainly as much as i can within one concert but in a season certainly something that will appeal to as wide an audience as possible and that could include some scary stuff um mm-hmm. that might include a piece for you know early on uh, a piece that got us actually a lot of press was a piece by ken ueno which it was scored for an amplified mandolin and amplified percussionist playing these tuned um soda cans mm-hmm. and you know that that was scary to a lot of people, but it also got a lot of people talking. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, in the same concert, we might do in that same concert we did a piece by Dave Cutler, and we, which was about superheroes, and mm-hmm. we might do, you know, yeah, I, I try to do that, but I don't, th- I don't think in terms of, oh, let's scare the audience. It's rather, I don't think the music needs to be scary. I think the things that people get scared by in contemporary concert music are. Um, the old fears that oh it's all so um, off-putting it's so dissonant it's all you know the tra- the, the old-fashioned way of looking at, at new music which yeah. you know I don't think needs to be scary it's a matter of how you present it and if you present it in a context of pieces that make people feel more comfortable I don't think and that this is why they don't riot um, <laughs> or this may be one reason why they don't riot is that they're more open if you if Mm-hmm. If you ease them into it <coughs> by programming Nico Muli next to Pierre Boulez, as you know, as much as that might make some people's heads explode, it might also bring in other people that um, wouldn't hear it otherwise. I, uh, actually, an example that just came to my mind, a couple of years ago, we did a collaboration at the Kennedy Center with uh, the Congressional Chorus, which is a, a group here in D.C. They, you know, made up of retired and current um, Hill staffers. That get together every week to sing and and then they put on a concert season and we did a concert with them where we accompanied them on some of their selections and then they sang um a piece of danny felsenfels that we commissioned and i also i played in that stage um my violin concerto which sadly hasn't won the grammire but uh <laughs> you know one one day maybe that piece will it's a violin concerto after all yeah um, right. in any case just to, uh, I had a lot of comments afterwards saying, well, you know, that was really unusual, but I'm glad you performed. And these are from like, you know, moms from the kids who are in the American Youth Choir, which is, the, the, you know, the youth chorus in the, in the congressional chorus, saying, 
that was really neat. It was really weird, and it's not music that I would have heard listened to otherwise. But you know, so like we put it in a context that was completely different, and you know, with music that we wouldn't have played necessarily in another context. And you know, it brought two audiences together in a way that was sort of surprising and 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 kind of welcoming and kind of exciting. And you know, that one person that comes up to you and says, "Hey." You know, I thought I was going to be really scared when I started hearing these first few chords, but then it went into this other thing. And it's like then, it's like it's totally different than what I like than my what I like and my comfort level. But I really liked it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they might they might actually start showing up to more concerts. Yeah, and you know, it's it's a little by little approach, but it's you know, it's you got to take you know, it's it's a good approach, I think. And I think that's that's why I I. I don't agree that maybe scaring people is the way to go, but um, challenging. I mean, scaring is is just another word for challenging. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think, I think that's really. I think that's what he's getting at. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, oh, I had something really insightful and cutting to say, and now it's just gone. Oh, I was no. I was so blown away, and, and Patrick is falling offline. It's and all right. Distracting me. How are we doing on time, Dave? We're we're pretty long. That's okay. Yeah. I was wondering if we wanted to punt on some of this stuff. I think it's good stuff. Okay. Well, okay, we'll punt on it. We'll punt on the the David Cutler article even though it's really we interesting. We talked about it already. Talked about it, yeah. We addressed it. Uh, we we can Armando talk on it. Ne- s- we can talk about it next week. I think it's really cool. Yeah. We'll talk yeah. about the art. We we'll just mentioned that it's there. David Cutler had a great write up this week about um a thing he's been doing with uh, New World Symphony kind of reimagining the orchestra and this is something that a question that I've asked before is is what would the orchestra look like if we reimagined it from the ground up <laughs> today with with no um preconceptions of of the tradition of the orchestra and so he imagines this uh orchestra in the not so far flung future of 2020 uh after all orchestras in the United States have gone under reforming an orchestra for the first time out of nowhere which is really interesting um so you should check that out and we'll have a link to it maybe we'll talk about it next week if we have time um not really that related story is uh the louisville orchestra who is trying to reconstitute itself um after having some uh rather uh unpleasant feelings between the, the orchestra and the musicians they are as we've talked about trying to replace their entire orchestra with non-union musicians. And um, they're having a hard time, I guess, finding some people because they have gone so far as to place ads on Craigslist for a relatively <laughs> large orchestra. Um, this is kind of a weird thing. They're, they're placing these ads on a lot of local Craigslists, which is kind of frowned upon on Craigslist. But uh, anyway... They, they've they've sent their flyers out to all these schools of music around the country, and that didn't pan out. Uh, and so now they're trying Craigslist. So um, the worst of luck to them. And uh, and as someone who started his group on Craigslist, uh, let me just say, uh, hey, that, that, <laughs> not, what they're doing is not cool. Because, yeah, it, it's trying to union bust on Craigslist. That's not what that's that's, how it's that's lame yeah. now yeah. i agree that that is lame uh, and the uh, julia preston has a response to that uh, drew mcmanus blog entry and in that she let create gives a link to a youtube uh video which is um somebody explaining um the problem with salary and breaking down the cost compared to other orchestras um while I think that using Craigslist to bust unions and all that is bad, I don't think she did herself a favor by including this video because as far as the financial situation that they find themselves in, the video I think makes a compelling argument and and how it compares itself to other organizations and what percentage of their mm. budget is, goes to salary and how many full-time musicians they have and everything. So uh, it, I'm just saying – we have to accept it's a nuanced problem, even though sort of the headline of this story is that they're doing the Craigslist thing. Right. Um, you should check the video out because it's a good it, – it shows lots of orchestras and gives an ex- a breakdown of how funding works, at least in that context. It would – I think is pretty interesting. Right, and, and we're not going to uh, – We're not going to unpack that. Re- relitigate uh, – can we call it a gate? 
Nah. <laughs> we'll call it with L- Louisville Gate. <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that. We got to come up oh, with something man. better. And, and we haven't even brought up <laughs> New York City Opera and what's been going on. You know, so the, so there that's week. the last thing. Is that's our that's our that's the real gate. <laughs> I think um, we're apparently uh, the occupiers have decamped Wall Street and are now occupying the Lincoln Center, and uh, they have been at the Met twice in the last three or four days uh we record this show on sunday morning um so just a few days ago at a performance of philip glass's uh satyagraha there were occupy protesters outside the metropolitan opera and philip glass himself joined them um apparently protesting his own work um and there's video on youtube of uh and you can't can't See that clearly what's going on here? So in case you couldn't understand that, uh, and that would be understandable, uh, they were using the, the people's mic, as they say, when one person speaks and then everybody that can hear them repeats it. Um, they were saying, when righteousness withers away and evil rules the land, we come into being age after age and take visible shape and move a man among men for the protection of good, thrusting back evil and setting virtue on her seat again, which uh, are lines from uh the opera uh so what do you guys think of protesting it at the met well i think (laughs) what they're trying to do is laudable um and they're trying to bring attention to um the fact that the cook brothers fund have funded a lot of the buildings at least in, in lincoln center and they're also big tea party um funders and big uh well, we're getting political now, aren't we? Nah. Um, it's, but, it happens um, from time to time. Well, but, you know, so, but, and regardless of Tea Party, you know, the similarities and differences between Tea Party and the Occupy movement, um, I think what the Occupy movement is protesting at Lincoln Center is the, is this appearance of elitism and, and, and Lincoln Center being a, a playground for the wealthy. Mm-hmm. Um and I, I find, I, I on on online I have been a, a vocal supporter of the Occupy movement, but I find that having Phil Glass, th- this this event with Phil Glass especially, made me feel very conflicted, um, because um, for one thing, the Met is actually really affordable. Um, they, you right. know, you can get cheap Family Circle tickets for um you know for like 20 bucks still i think um and you can see you know you can go see an opera and you know it, it, you can get student rush tickets really easily and whatnot so it's not just a playground for the rich and famous and the glamorous well um, i think i think they're saying that just because of the idea that there are like subscribers to the met subscribers oh, right. yeah like, i don't know i don't but yeah. then, then there's this idea that um what, what what worries me, or what 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 the the source of my confusion is, though, that um, you know Philip Glass is is protesting, is joining this protest, um, and rightly so. It's a it's a valid protest in 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 terms of the generalities, but in protesting at at Lincoln Center, the 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 notion is that you're protesting the sources of funding that support the creation of art. Um, which depend on a lot of... I know, 45% of, of the Mets' funding is is donor-based. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, you know, it makes me feel really weird. Like, you know, it's, it's, you know, on the one hand, you know, what's the difference between the Mets soliciting 
uh, donors and you know a grassroots organization going on on Kickstarter and soliciting donors at the at that level, um, and you know or or fighting, especially someone like Phil Glass, like fighting the system that he has managed to navigate so well. Right. You know, it it, it feels a little bit disingenuous. Yeah. Uh, if not downright hypocritical. Sure. And boy, this clip is going to come back and, and haunt me. But um, but at the same time, I really I support it. You know, it's like well, I, I can I don't want to because I, I, I feel like Phil Glass that, you know, things in this country have gone. Um, it, it th there's a lack of balance. Right. Um, and in the terms in terms of wealth distribution and the things that are important to us as a culture. Right. Um, a lot of what I do is because I feel like we fight, you know, as, com as artists, we're fighting for the soul of the nation. And if we give up the fight, our nation's soul is, is just, you know, tin. Um, but, you know, the fact that Phil Glass makes a pretty, pretty good living as a composer, you know, cab driving till he was 42 or whatever, notwithstanding, um, he, um, it feels a little bit weird. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I wouldn't worry too much about this clip coming back to buy you. There aren't that many people that watch the show, and even fewer oh. listen this far into it. Um, but uh, I will say this, and there was another incident uh, just last night, Saturday night, uh, December 3rd, uh, at the Met again, though at a performance not of Philip Glass, but of Gunod's Faust, um, which I think it was Alex Ross decided to call Occupy Faust um, where right before the third act started uh, after intermission somebody started shouting Occupy Wall Street over and over again um, and a guy had to come out on stage uh, from the staff and as soon as he came out on stage the shouting person stopped um, and I don't know if that was because somebody else had stopped him uh, b but it was just a guy shouting Occupy Wall Street and it that was all the interruption um, that there was. There was it, it didn't even interrupt the performance, which I thought was very polite. Um, <laughs> but the the idea that the Metropolitan Opera represents this highfalutin entertainment of the one percent is a little annoying to me, um, because as as Armando, as you pointed out, the Met is actually very affordable. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had Alex Ross on the show, and we were talking about, um, you know, the 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 expense of going to the Met versus the expense of going to a Billy Joel show, right. and it's it's night and day. Right. You know, it's way more expensive to go to a Broadway see, musical or or Broadway musical. Yeah. These things that are considered more much more mainstream are way more expensive than going to hear an orchestra or going to hear an opera. Right. And it's just this, uh, the, the, the tucks and tails I will say idea of, of the arts is really bothersome. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's where a lot of this, the idea of this protest comes from. Um, though certainly the, the, the Koch brothers and the extremely wealthy subscribers uh, are, are an important part of this. Um, in general, I don't think it's that crazy, uh, this, this crazy, obscene display of wealth. I think you should exclude opening night at the Met from that. But <laughs> other performances, yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, th have you seen the, the people that go see, like, Wagner at the Met with their horns? Like, they're, like, this close... To if you're listening, my fingers are very close together. <laughs> They're like this close to like painting their chests and shouting like a football game. Yeah. Now, I was that, we'll leave yesterday. that to the brass section after they do some Wagner. <coughs> Boom. <laughs> but, and that's and that's I think you know we're still dealing in many ways with a with a kind of romantic notion of what what concert music is. This is why I don't like saying classical music because that right there just connotes that notion of the tuxes and right. the, you know, the, this is the, the church of art and you must, you know, behave accordingly. Yeah. And, and it's just on its head now. And, you know, you go to Spider-Man, turn off the dark and that it costs you a ticket will cost you 60, 70. I don't know how much it costs, but, uh, 
you know, it'll cost you. You can watch the ring cycle theoretically for eighty bucks at the Met, twenty right. bucks a ticket, and that's maybe one ticket for for. And that's seventeen hours of music, right? For <laughs> and then you get <laughs> Spider Man, which you know took a year to get to a point where it wasn't embarrassing. And people talk about a success. Some, some would say they're still working on success. that. That's right. Um, but they're super. Uh, they're making a lot of money with that right now, even though yeah. it's, despite bad reviews. Right. I think because, in, because yeah. of bad reviews. <laughs> right. Yeah. And yeah. So uh, it's it's and and I think that and that's it, it's kind of disappointing that that because the uh, the Occupy movement is so much about point painting uh, drawing attention to these priorities that have been turned on their head or, or, or cultural things that have been turned on their head in this country mm-hmm. and that they you know that it's become that things in terms of music have turned been turned so drastically that they don't even see that they've been turned drastically yeah yeah it's a little disappointing well I was disappointed uh, in um, the we, well going back to a previous episode we had talked about the occupy museum movement mm-hmm. with this a very small thing that was going on in new york but i like the idea of taking the occupy wall street sort of idea about direct representation in government or whatever it is you're talking about occupying and they were talking about you know who is involved in being the tastemakers in art and this kind of thing mm-hmm. and that to me seems like a, a pretty salient uh, thing to talk about in regards to you know uh, big performing organizations um it's unfortunate to me that sort of just a very generalized occupy wall street <laughs> screaming happened at car at uh lincoln center uh whereas if you're gonna talk uh, you know take this kind of idea and move it towards something like carnegie hall i think it should be a more nuanced discussion of mm-hmm. you know who's making the decisions about what what is good and bad art and what pieces will and won't be performed and who are the good and bad composers and all that that would be a good discussion to have regarding that kind of an organization, but but I don't think it's like we said uh, a very good idea to start saying that, associating that with uh, you know the one percent as far as money and also uh, quickly Alex Ross has a link uh, on his little blurb about it to what he calls cheap seats page. Uh, uh-huh. You might be interested. It's a listing of inexpensive uh, tickets to things that are all over the country too. So yeah, that's check cool. that out. But I think it's a I good think- discussion that needs to happen, you know. But it, you know, hopefully, it'll bring up that discussion that Sam was was just talking about in the context of 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 what we do. But yeah, um, yeah so hopefully, it will serve that purpose. It's like, hey, you know, we've been giving you cheap seats forever, and you're just not coming. Yeah, check right. it out. So unfortunately, correct. we don't have a lot of time left. Do you want to say something real quick, Patrick? Yeah, I just wanted to correct myself. When I said 45% actually meant $45 million in donor money for 2010-2011. <laughs> so, I mean, it there still it sounds a lot. I just wanted to $45 million? I, I, I looked at the... Um, Do you know how much it costs to put on an opera? Couple. I know. Yeah. It's, like, sure it's like making <laughs> Transformers 5. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All, of those, all of those documents are um, publicly available. And as a nonprofit, you have to put them on your website so you can yeah. check out the annual reports for the met new york philharmonic wherever you want yeah cool. awesome so anyway uh pick of the week pick of the week oh unfortunately boy. uh we don't have a lot of time to talk about it we've kind of been talking a lot uh already but we certainly still want to bring everyone's attention to uh armando's piece we have uh an excerpt uh from uh armando bajolo's trombone concerto absolute music do you want to tell us a little bit about this piece before we play it sure um i don't know which movement you're going to end up playing but um which would you like us to play yeah. well um well let's just start the beginning i guess all right um, that's, that's what we were going to um, do okay awesome <laughs> so the piece was this talk about like social media and stuff this piece was uh, commissioned or it came about through contact on facebook of cool. all of all things um <laughs> A couple of years ago, I got I reconnected with an old friend from my music camp days at Interlochen, and she mentioned that her her husband was a trombonist, or her husband at the time uh, was a trombonist, and and she said you should write him a piece. I said yeah yeah sure you know let's let's do it, and a few months later he wrote me and said hey you know I'm Maggie's husband and she's been playing me your music and I really like it and I've come up on the rotation to play a solo with my orchestra. Um, this orchestra they play he plays with in Denmark. The, um, 
and I would like to commission you. And so would you mind if we send a proposal and all this stuff? And we sent the proposal and they, they, they like the way the artist is doing a first piece. And um, it was premiered last January, or January of this year, um, with the South Jutland Symphony Orchestra in, um, in, they're in Northern Denmark. It's, it, and, oh, my geography is terrible. I don't mm. even know if it's Northern Denmark. Don't quote me on that. But, um, um, and uh, con- the trombonist is Philip Brown. He's, uh, the trump is, uh, I think he's the assistant principal. I'm not sure exactly. I can't remember his title. Sounds um, but great in the recording too. Yeah, he's fantastic. And the conductor is Maximiano Valdez, which as it turned out, he's a, a music director in the Puerto Rico Symphony, which is where I grew up. Cool. Um, so out of this, like, I've kind of developed a relationship with him as a, you know, where we become friends and we work together a few times and um, in Puerto Rico um, because of this project. So um, it's been a, a great project. So I, I ended up dedicating the piece to Margaret Pittman um, because it just opened all these other doors and it was all through this connection in Facebook, um, which I think is really interesting. Cool. Excellent. Well, we'll, well, well here, here goes a little bit from the first Okay. Part. So we've been trying to limit ourselves to a minute at a time. And <laughs> that was great. Thank yeah. you for, oh, for sharing that with us. That was, f- again, Philip Brown uh, performing Armando Vajolo's Trombone Concerto, Absolute Music. That's an excerpt from the first movement. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us, Armando. Oh, my pleasure. And what an, can I say, what an American-sounding trombone sound that is. That's weird, isn't it? <laughs> I gotta say, uh, that is gotta say. a super creamy sound. I love uh-huh. it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um. So we we'd love to talk about it some more, but we're we're Way really over time. really long uh, today. Right. Um. So we we apologize, Armando. Thank you so much for oh, no, joining no. us, though. Do you have uh? You talked about some of your some of your uh upcoming events uh, a bit ago, but do you want to really quick at the end plug any? Uh, any upcoming stuff you have going on? Well, I'll, uh, I, I plugged in some. Uh, I plugged some of the great noise and Atlas stuff. So let me just plug one of my own pieces um, for a change. Um, the next big one. Well, I have a, a, a small song setting being performed local in DC by a Boston-based project that a friend of mine, Tom Schnauber, runs called Words and Music. Oh. You know what? No, that's the project here in Alexandria. I can't remember what Tom. He's gonna kill me. But I can't remember <laughs> what the project's called. But they commissioned a number of composers to write songs, art song settings of the same text. So oh, we're cool. doing a project in January on Langston Hughes Harlem, hmm. which is, goes up in at the end of January, and then in mid February, uh, my third symphony is premiering in Eugene, Oregon. Um, it's a consortium commission led by the University of Oregon Wind Ensemble with Robert Ponzo. And so they're premiering that on February 12th in Eugene. Um, and I'm, I'm busy furiously copying parts for that now. Um, but that, that should be really, that's, I'm really excited about that project. It's a, a really Sounds unique fantastic. piece. And yeah, thank you. Excellent. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me.
Uh, that's it for this week's Sound Notion. To read more about any of the topics that we've covered or comment on the show, you can head on over to soundnotion.tv slash sn and leave us a note. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter where we're at Sound Notion. All of us individually, including Armando, are also mm-hmm. on Twitter. Um, this show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store, so be sure to subscribe and catch every episode. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next week.